Uh, before I turn it over to the moderators, I want to thank the candidates, thank the moderators, thank all of you. Don't forget to vote on November 7th. Early voting is happening throughout the city. The schedule is outside. And let's have the honest and fair exchange of viewpoints that Worcester voters deserve. So on that note, I'm happy to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Kim Salmon. Thank you, Paul. I'm gonna get us started um, just uh, to restate that you'll each have two minutes for your opening statements um, and everyone will have an opportunity to speak. We will really keep to the time, okay? Thank you. We're gonna start with opening statements. Kate Toomey, you have two minutes. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kate Toomey, and I'm running for re-election to the Worcester City Council because I'm committed to continuing the work that I've been a part of to make positive change in Worcester. We need more adult education and training so that we can get people to work so they can provide good jobs and get great housing. We need to continue to build upon our infrastructure systems, including transportation. We need to ensure that our city employees reflect the diverse community in which we live and we need to ensure that our public safety departments are trained to address the issues affecting our community with addiction, homelessness, and mental health issues. I bring a depth and breadth of experience to the City Council that many do not have. In my private life, I've been an educator, involved in the senior care field, the addiction treatment field, and I'm currently working in reentry for the Worcester County Sheriff's Office. As a former school committee member, I understand the importance of great schools and the needs for our students. As City Council, I've been Chair of Traffic and Parking, Education, Public Works, and Public Safety. I understand the need for technology as our city grows, the importance of a walkable city, and the need to ensure we provide a green Worcester for our children's future. I also want a city that ensures no matter what neighborhood you're from, no matter race, religion, ethnicity, or gender, Worcester is a place that you can succeed and, and raise a family. I'm proud of Worcester. 116 different countries are represented by residents who speak over 80 different native languages. I've worked to make sure that our city reaches out to minority-owned, women-owned, and veteran-owned businesses so they have support to expand and access state and municipal contracts. I hope that you will consider giving me one of your uh, votes on uh, November 7th. I'm number three on the ballot and humbly ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Christian King. Good evening. I want to thank everyone for hosting this. Um, it's very much appreciated. My name is Christian King, and I'm a city councilor at large in my eighth term. I'm a social worker and a father, a girl dad, father of three girls, um, all of who were raised here in the city and have attended educational institutions in our city. I've dedicated my life to public service um, and mentoring young people throughout Worcester. Um, I'm uniquely qualified to be your city councilor at large and your next mayor. Um, I have, as a social worker for almost 30 years, I've sat at tables throughout our city, um, problem solving, meeting with folks. Um, and it's a unique perspective that we give to the council um, and to the city that allows me to um, really problem solve and, you know, my, what I'm known for is rolling up my sleeves and going to work. Um, I'm very proud that I've um, been able to, to work on, on equity in the city of Worcester, making sure we have a recruiting and retention improvements in the city of Worcester, um, and you know, transparency and accountability. Um, we've had an economic renaissance here, but it hasn't trickled down to everyone. There are additional measures, and those measures are how we treat our most vulnerable, our youth, our elderly. And we can do more, we ought to do more. Um, the same old leadership that we've had has not uh, closed those loops. Housing prices are, stock, are rising. Quality of life is the most important issue, affordability um, and public health and public safety. And those are the areas that we can continue to improve on. Um, and my name is Christian King and I'm looking forward to be a city councilor for my fifth term and hoping to be the next mayor of Worcester. Thank you. Johanna Hampton Dance. Thank you. My name is Johanna Hampton Dance. I am a longtime resident of Worcester for 44 years. I went to Columbus Park Elementary. I went to South High School in Worcester Tech when it was Worcester Volk. I do have some college credits. I worked for UMass. Um, 
a subdivision of UMass called U Health Solutions, where we provided information and referral to uh, elderly and disabled throughout the state of Massachusetts. Currently, I am a caregiver to my son. Um, I'm running for council because there has been a lack of equity for a very, very long time. And we talk about change, and there seems to be no movement when it comes to change. We have a council that's been a council for years, and we haven't seen any change. So now it's time to elect new council, new blood, get people in there who actually want to see the needle on the record move. Thank you. Thank you. Guillermo Kramer. Thank you for being here tonight. I'm here as a proud product of the city and your candidate for mayor and city council at large. Worcester deserves a chief advocate and I'm committed to doing just that. My experiences from attending Elm Park, Nativity and Bancroft are not just mine alone. They echo the diverse and varied paths Worcester residents have. It's a path defined by immigrants like my own parents who navigated tough financial situations during my upbringing. Democracy thrives on choices, and I have actively listened to Worcester's residents, ensuring that their voices are heard. As the lead community organizer for the Now Next City Project, an initiative that was the first one in over 40 years, I connected with hundreds of residents and small business owners, ensuring their concerns were at the forefront of the city's future development. In the face of one of the most partisan eras in Congress, I co-founded and led a nonpartisan effort to diversify our workforce pipeline, demonstrating my commitment to bridging divides and getting things done. Worcester, as the second largest city in New England, deserves a mayor committed to the next chapter of our city's future. I moved back to Worcester to build my family in a city that helped shape me into the person I am today. Tonight, I am here unapologetically in front of all of you, offering you not just a choice, but a vision a vision forged through dedication, inclusivity, and a tireless commitment to the ideals that make Worcester great. I am here because Worcester deserves a leader with bold ideas and a proven track record of getting things done. I hope you, when you leave here this evening, I have earned one of your six votes at large and become your mayoral choice. Thank you. Thank you. My day, Morales. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here and for holding this event. My name is Maide Morales, and I am running for city council at large for the people in this city. I am an Afro-Latina from Puerto Rico, and I have worked and lived in this city for over 30 years, always in the nonprofit sector. And I want to amplify the voices of those that I have served. I am a homeowner, I'm a mother and a grandmother, and I am a doer. And I want to be part of the change that is so, such, so needed in our city. I have been and I continue to sit across the desk of the people of this city um, for whom the system does not work. I have heard directly from them how these systems hurt them and I want to do everything in my power to make the needed changes to our city and our policies um, so that all who live and work in our city will benefit. I feel like our city council is often at odds and has not been able to move our city forward. I want to use my skills of collaboration that I have gained throughout my time working here and living here to the municipality and utilize these to move our city forward. I want to have a, transparent and a, a transparency and accountability for our city. Thank you so much. My name is Maiden Morales, and I'm running for city council at large for the city of Worcester. I hope I can get your vote. Number two on the ballot. Thank you. Joe Petty. Good evening, everyone. And I want to thank the Worcester Research Bureau and the sponsors for the debate. I want to thank my fellow candidates for being in here and running for office. We all know it's not easy in today's political climate to be pointing ourselves out there. I'm running for re-election for council at large and for mayor. After six mayoral terms, I'm looking back at what I've done and what I'd like to continue to do, and I want to think about what brought me to becoming the mayor. I'd like to go back to the basics. I have the privilege to talk to many Worcester residents who want to focus on clean streets, public safety, affordable housing, the environment, and job creation, and job creation, and job creation. 
I believe that my record is very strong. Today, according to U.S. News, Worcester is the eighth safest city in America, and that did not come by accident. It's been through hard work that I have overseen and supported by adding new police classes. Worcester Police Department is being made younger, more diverse, and offers people a meaningful career opportunity. I have supported Worcester's Green Plan, which will reduce our carbon footprint. I've also helped with ensuring the future developments are built in an environmentally sustainable way to increase efficiency and reduce emissions. I have supported a reasonable inclusionary zoning ordinance, where hopefully we will create more affordable housing. But this selection is about Worcester's future. What kind of city do we want to be? An effort to become the cleanest gateway city in Massachusetts by proposing 1,000 new trees be planted by 2026. The guy on the streets, I have requested innovative floating sidewalks as a tool to increase safety for pedestrians and improve safety in our neighborhoods. I've also set a goal with the administration to become the cleanest gateway city in Massachusetts. These plans will make a difference in addressing our fundamental parts of Worcester. What our city needs is a council that can work together. My strongest skill set is working to solve problems. So may, some may say that I'm too moderate. However, it is important that we have an even keel leader it is key to the success and welcome, success and welcoming all, and ensuring that diverse voices are heard. I look forward to hearing my fellow candidates will have to say tonight. I ask for your vote on November 7th um, for mayor and for city council. Thank you. Thank you. Donna Colorio. It's already on? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Donna Colorio, and I'm seeking a third term as a city councilor at large. I spent the last four years as vice chair of the city council, chair of parking and traffic, fixing decade-old issues on Clover Street, Upper Pleasant Street, Tyson Street, and many other street issues. After listening to residents' concerns about safety in the city, I am proud of my vote to support the police, police in the schools, which are important to build early positive relationships between students and police, body cameras, and shot spotter connect. I will continue to vote to fully fund the police in order to ensure we have the proper amount of police in the city to compensate for our increase in population. I was a proud to vote to keep the friendliest, lowest tax rate knowing that the medium inca income in Worcester is approximately 51,000, 39 percent lower than the state average, 84,000. Raising the residential taxes would be disastrous for the residents of Worcester, especially those on a fixed income. I am proud to vote against the CPA tax, which will cause hardship to many residents and businesses. As a lifelong resident of Worcester, I love the city. I have raised my three children in Worcester. I know Worcester is a great place to live and work. As a businesswoman in a family-run business, I understand the role small businesses play in our community. As a small business, I have provided thousands of jobs to our immigrant community. I am a proud of my Albanian-Italian descent, and I know how difficult it is to land your first job in a new country, listening to my employees and others in our diverse community. My name is Donna Colorio, and I humbly ask for your vote on Tuesday, November 7th. Thank you. Thank you. Dominica Perot. Thank you. My name is Dominica Perron, and I am running for Worcester City Council at large because I want to continue to ensure that we are prioritizing equity throughout all aspects of our municipal government. And to that, to me, that largely means investing in comprehensive public health solutions. That looks like affordable, accessible, high quality, early education and care, health care, safe, affordable places to live all over the city, not just in certain pockets, a cultural economy, a sustainable and resilient city, supporting small businesses while also valuing our large employers. Currently, I work at Clark University as Director for Community Engagement and Volunteering, but prior to that, I was a Program Manager at the Department of Health and Human Services in the City of Worcester, where I got the opportunity up close to work during the pandemic across lines in our city and mobilize with our community members to address emergent needs. I also had the opportunity to deeply understand how our city's budget works, and I'm able to use that knowledge to now advocate for that equity. Prior to that, I worked at the Latino Education Institute where I was providing culturally appropriate after-school programming to youth in our city. I am a renter, I have two master degrees, and I wanna be able to afford a house in our city. I wanna be able to afford to have a family in our city. 
I am an Ecuadorian immigrant. I was raised in northern New Jersey by my single mother and my two older sisters and my grandmother. And that is the lens that I carry with me throughout all the things that I see. I have a deep value for intergenerational families and the immigrant experience. I'm a listener, I work hard, and our city is changing. And we need a city council that is ready to reflect that change and do the work on the ground to move forward with progress. We deserve to have a committed city council that is ready to mitigate the emergent crises that we have, which there are many, and I'm sure we'll discuss those tonight. For these reasons, I humbly ask for your vote on November 7th, lucky number six. Thank you. Morris Bergman. Thank you. A lot of people are going to talk about what's wrong with Worcester. I want to talk about what's right with Worcester. I had a front row seat on the city council for five terms for 10 years. During those 10 years, the population of Worcester has grown more than any other city in Massachusetts. It doesn't sound to me like there's that much wrong with Worcester, but that many people want to come here. People that come here, though, are looking for opportunities. They're looking for opportunities for jobs. They're looking for opportunities to have good quality public school systems, safe neighborhoods, and good parks. I think we provide those opportunities, but I think we can do better. We can always do better. We can do better with home ownership opportunities, something I've been talking about for a very long time. Two-thirds of the people in Worcester rent their properties. Only one-third owns. That's a complete reversal of Worcester County. And the people that own their own property are, are invariably not in the minority community. We need to do better with home ownership opportunities. We need to do better with our parks. We continue to build new parks, but we don't fix the existing older parks. Makes no sense. Would you buy a new car before paying off your old car? We also need to do better with our streets and sidewalks. Anybody driving around the city of Worcester these days knows how frustrating it is to get from point A to point B. We need to um, start with synchronized lights on major roads so we don't have to stop at every red light all the time. It's good for our drivers, it's good for getting to work or school on time, and it's good for the environment. There's a lot more to do. I'm also the child of immigrants as well. And I know it's difficult to navigate City Hall. I can remember my parents always telling me it's not easy to have a friend at City Hall. I've been that friend to people for the last decade. It's why I became a lawyer, helping one person at a time. And it's why I became a city councilor, because I can help a lot of people all the time. I'm number 10 on the ballot. I'm asking all of you to continue to keep me at City Hall, have a friend at City Hall. It's a lot more work to do, and I'm energized to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Coleman. Hello, I'm Bill Coleman, I'm running for city council at large, and I'm also a candidate for mayor. I need your vote to be on the city council. I've run for city council before, and in the last almost 30 years, I've been a non-paid city councilor addressing the issues of people in this community who want to approach city hall through petitions, cleaning up neighborhoods, trying to get involved in city government, encouraging people to apply for positions at city, uh, in City Hall and to work for the city of Worcester. Worcester is a city, as some people have said, is in a renaissance. We want to move. Well, we've been on the renaissance for a long time, but we need to expand those real opportunities so that people can feel that this community is reflective of the growth and diversity of its newest populations. I ask simply for your vote November 6th, give me a chance to be the voice that you may feel is not at City Hall listening to you. And I just simply ask on November 7th, give me a chance. Thank you. Thank you. This, uh, we're gonna start with question one. This is for everyone. Everyone will have an opportunity to respond and you'll each get one minute. The question is compromise. In setting policy directives for the city, a majority, Can you hear me? Sorry, I will do that again. <laughs> the question is compromise. In setting policy directives for the city, a majority or supermajority vote is often required. Do you feel that the council is performing effectively? Is there room for compromise on the council? Give an example of how you have or would compromise with a colleague. We'll start with Bill Coleman. You know, President John Kennedy once said that um, politics is the art of compromise. And at times when I've, I've been city council meetings, when there's been stalemates six to 
you know, when, when the vote has been so divided, when the conversation has been so divided, you, you miss the point of everything. I believe that in order for our city to move forward, we have to move forward together, step by step. We have to listen to each other. We have to respect the opinions of other city councilors. And if I'm elected to the city council, I will compromise. But I also reflect the voice of the people of this community in that compromise. Thank you. Joe Petty. I think one of my successes as mayor and as a city council has always been the odds of compromise. And uh, it's important that we listen to both sides of an issue, trying to come up with the right solution. Uh, like an example of inclusionary zoning, for instance, which became a heated debate. Uh, we had an inclusionary zoning policy developed by the manager, his team, we're going to all sides of the issue, presented to the council, and, uh, and we spent a year really debating it back and forth, trying to, but people didn't want to compromise, and uh, so we wasted the year where people couldn't, where the developers were coming in, not being part of the inclusionary zoning. And uh, so, and the council, and uh, could have not voted no inclusionary zoning uh, that night, unless we had eight votes to pass that. So we had to compromise in order to get that done, because it would have been the worst situation if it was only seven votes, or if it was a six to five vote, we would have had no inclusion or rezoning. So that's an example of compromise and try to get a policy through the city of Worcester. Thank you. Donna Calorio. Thank you. So I look at the role of a city councilor is to listen to our constituents, our fellow colleagues, and come up with the best um, vote we can basically come up with. So. If you look at where council's votes are, there's times I voted one way, there's times I vote another way. And I think that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about listening. We're talking about compromise. And I think that that's really, it's an important thing because the city has many pockets of many different people that we represent, especially myself, because I'm a council at large, I represent the whole city. So I not only represent the west side, I represent the east side as well, the north Worcester, et cetera. So it's important. One thing that I do in, um, is I do a lot of door knocking. I do a lot of work on the ground, working with people, listening to people, and seeing what's happening in each neighborhood. So I think compromise is really important. Thank you. Thank you. Morris Bergman. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to answer the question differently, but I can only answer it honestly. I think part of the issue that has happened on the city council is we have I activist ideas which are important, but they don't always result in us being the best public servants. And the level of respect, if you can go on social media and follow um, some of what's said, isn't where it should be. There's a lot of good that should be said about social media, but there's a downside to it too. And it can be alienating and, can, and it can be uh, disrespectful. I think we can compromise and I think we can do a better job doing it, but we have to be more, act more as public servants. You asked for an example. Um, I propose that there be speed humps, speed humps throughout the city of Worcester on streets where we had no other alternatives to slow traffic down. Uh, there was a pushback for a long time on whether or not these speed pumps could be installed permanently because of issues mm -hmm. regarding um, snow plows and, and other concerns, and they became temporary speed humps, and they're t put in in May, and they're taken out in uh, November, and they become very success successful, and Thank you. something I appreciate compromising on. Thank, Thank you. you. Dominica Perone. An example of a time that I got firsthand to experience compromising at a municipal level was when I worked at HHS and we started to do the emergency homeless shelters during the COVID um, pandemic at the beginning. Um, I think that time period, we had the public schools at the table, we had behavioral health care providers, we had the city at the table, and all of us were able to come together to mobilize immediately, within days. And so that to me is one of the many reasons I'm running for city council because municipal government lets us know we can do these things. We can move these things and make a change in that reality for people every day. At the same time, I also wanna be clear that I believe in transparency and I believe that we have crises on our hands and certain crises need to be responded with advocacy and fierce advocacy. That being said, I'm diplomatic, 
I'm articulate, and I'm happy to talk to all my colleagues here at the table about these issues. Thank you. Christian King. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I like to begin by saying, you know, I've, I've certainly come to experience the real time um, challenges when it comes to diversity of thought and governance. It's a contention um, that's necessary for democracy. It's a process that's necessary in order for us to move forward um, effectively. Groupthink is not the way to go. And particularly when it comes to issues um, pertaining the rights and values of people, laborers, small businesses, children, youth and families, and issues of equity. There are certain matters, Will, when in my governing, I will not waver. My equity lens does not blur as an elected official of color. Um, it's necessary. Um, it's necessary to do it respectfully. In addition to that, I'll say with compromise, certainly compromise with regards to um, the diversity reorganization where they merged health and human services um, Thank you. with the human rights division. Thank you. Johanna Hampton Dance. I believe the question is, do you feel the council is performing effectively and is there compromise? I'm not long-winded, so I'm just gonna say I do not feel that the council is performing effectively, and no, there is not compromise. As Christian said, when it comes to a group think mentality, that's what takes place every Tuesday at 6.30 when there's an important vote on the floor for something that has to do with people. Anything that has to do with people always gets stomped out. And so no, I do not think that there is compromise. Thank you. Guillermo Kramer. I think most of our city, sitting city councilors have avoided the actual question, which is no, currently the council is not effective. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that we're not willing to actually work together. One of the reasons why I'm running for mayor is because new leadership is needed to ensure that we can actually work together and not just elect folks that are leading a certain block. I think the reality is, is that we need to make sure that we're sitting at the table, working together. I was able to do that in Washington during one of the most contentious times where bipartisanship was not a thing in 20, during the Trump era. But we successfully got over 100 million allocated for black and brown folks to make sure that we were diversifying our workforce pipeline. I was proud of that work. And I hate the fact that I have to bring that type of mentality here to Worcester because that's not what our residents want. Our residents want to make sure that we're moving our city forward. We're talking about the stuff that matters to them, like trash, like sidewalks. And so we need to make sure that we're moving in that direction. Thank you. My day, Morales. Thank you. Um, I actually don't look at it as compromise. I actually look at it as collaboration. In a compromise, there's one side that is going to be unhappy and doesn't agree with the situation, they're not getting their needs met. So in collaboration, um, I feel like I have done that for many years now in our community, and there is room for innovative ideas when folks are collaborating together. Everyone gets heard around the table, and you come up with um, a, uh, a project, an idea, and then everyone's working together on this project. Um, I've done that many, many times. For example, when our evacuees came from Puerto Rico during Maria, we met on a weekly basis at City Hall and all providers worked together and we took care of over a thousand people that came into the city. So for me, it's about collaboration, not compromise. Thank you. Kate Toomey. Thank you. Um, compromise, understanding, uh, Two-way conversations, listening are all elements uh, that we need to uh, utilize as an elected official. Um, and sometimes it's difficult when people are extremely um, uh, focused on the end result. Uh, and I think that it's been uh, over the years, I've really learned that uh, sometimes you have to uh, understand that you're not going to always get your way um, and that uh, an example would be the tax vote. Um, I've worked very hard to try to compromise uh, with my colleagues on, on the tax votes. And I think that that's something that we all work toward. Thank you. 
Thank you. Good evening, candidates. Good evening, audience. I am Stephen Schimmel with question number two, which will be for Donna Calorio, and I'll ask Paul and Josh, am I to advise the other the candidates who will be offering their responses as well? Okay, for this question, there will be three responses from Johanna Hampton Dance, Bill Coleman, and Domenica Perone. The question is for Donna Calorio. The citywide planning process will be finalized in the fall of 2023 and will serve as a roadmap for the next city council. How do you feel about the planning process and are you committed to following through with its recommendation? Donna Calorio. Thank you. Um, so I think it's important that we always, as a city councilor, have input into the process and what we have, what we have to work with. So I think that the process starts off that we get recommendations, then we bring it to the council floor and we discuss it, then usually it goes to a standing committee where it's discussed even more than back to our committee to be voted on. So I think that I'm committed to the, to the outcome of whatever we decide at the end and what we vote on. Thank you. Thank you. Johanna Hampton Dance, one minute. Thank you. I think the thing that was missing or um, persons that was missing from Donna's answer was actually bringing people into the conversation and getting the input from the community and the people who live in the city who these decisions will affect and making sure that everybody's aware that before what comes down the pipeline in this whole planning process is spread across the board and then involving everyone in a decision that lives in a city that is going to affect them and give them the opportunity to say, hey, we'd like to see X, Y, and Z, or no, we don't want to see that, and then making a, a, a plan to move forward and put it on a floor and vote and all the whole process of the council. Thank you. Bill Coleman. I agree with Johanna Hampton Dance. We need to bring more people into the process. You know, we wonder why we have 108,000 eligible voters in the city of Worcester and maybe 9% turn out to vote, or 16%, which is being predicted for November 7th. We have to ask people their opinion on what the city is planning, what we need to hold more neighborhood meetings and more neighborhood input and that input needs to be published in our local pub, uh, newspapers and on our radio stations. So I think that more input from the community through a process that is explained to the public uh, how the city will move forward with it. Thank you. Domenica Perone. I would just echo what Johanna and Dr. Coleman just shared. I agree that we need to stop expecting community to go to city council meetings at a certain hour or meet with certain people during certain times that are inaccessible to folks because they're at work or taking care of families. We need to work with community coalitions and ambassadors to meet communities where they are. We need a participatory process that speaks to the civic engagement we need in our city. We have a lack of civic engagement that is demonstrated in our low voter turnout but it seeps into other aspects as well. It seeps into who's able to participate in city council meetings, who's the loudest when they call their city councilors in certain areas and certain districts. And when that happens, we have a city council that is not reflective of our city. Thank you. And a 30 second rebuttal from Donna Calorio. Thank you. So um, just to educate everyone that every city council meeting we do have public participation and we usually extend it much longer to make sure that everyone has a voice. We also have public participation in the standing meetings. And just an FYI, when I was um, looking at the making Upper Pleasant Street more safe, we, I went around to the, all the neighborhoods, over 300 flyers to get public participation and I had 150 people in the Tatnick Square area at that meeting to participate so we heard their voice. Thank you. Thank you. Question number three deals with the subject of housing. It'll first go to Domenica Perone, followed by Joseph Petty, Christian King, Maide Morales, and with a 30 second rebuttal from Domenica Perone. 
There have been a number of housing policies debated during this last city council term. How do you think Worcester should address housing affordability? Are there other policies not yet arisen that should be debated? What role does private sector and the development community play in creating affordable housing? Domenica Perone, one minute. Thank you. Um, I will start with saying that we are in a housing crisis and that Worcester is, I think, number two on one of the least affordable places to be able to have an affordable house in the country. So I do not think that we're going well and I do think that what we've seen in the most recent term has been reflective of that. I think inclusionary zoning, to, not to compromise on inclusionary zoning is not one of the things that I would have compromised on. We need to fight for something that is more bold. When we say we are in a housing crisis, we need to respond as such. We also need to ensure that we're supporting community partners such as CDCs, uh, Worcester Common Ground, um, because the work that they are doing is how you combat the gentrification that is coming with this Worcester Renaissance that is not uplifting everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Joseph Petty, one minute. Huh. Thank you. Uh, this is a top priority of mine, is housing, affordable housing. We've done a number of things, whether it be the Housing Trust Fund, the Community Preservation Act, inclusion and rezoning, uh, working on accessible dwelling units. Uh, we just announced a $25,000 grant program here in the city of Worcester for down payers assistance, and also $15,000 for rental assistance here in the city of Worcester, as long as the, uh, it meets certain requirements. One of the things that was in um, Governor Haley's package last week that she signed was regarding uh, for how to make affordable housing better for people. So one of the things the, we should look at as a city is uh, how to apply for landlords who certain tenants meet qualifications for affordable housing, how to give those landlords a discount in their tax rate if you provide affordable housing. That's another way of looking at it. We're also looking at accessory dwelling units here in the city of Worcester. How do we make more apartments available for people throughout here in the city of Worcester, which is a priority going forward here in the city. Thank you. Christian King, one minute. I'm very proud that I voted for more affordability during the inclusionary zoning process, not less. And what we need to do is follow the data. What does the research say? Not anecdotes and stories and concerns bought by developers, but concerns bought by the people. Inclusionary zoning was supported by the planning board, um, the Economic Development Committee the, that I'm vice chair of, the majority of us voted to move that forward. And during these times, and during the housing crisis, we have to do exactly that. Let's rely on research. Um, the private sector um, is absolutely necessary. When we're given millions of dollars in tax breaks, we ought to be able to ask to do more for our people to do more for the folks who are trying to age in place in dignity, to do more for the folks who are trying to come into the workplace and raise a family. It's very important um, that we look at the research. Thank you. My Day Morales, one minute. Thank you. Um, yes, everyone is gonna tell you that we need more housing. But for me, what is most important is having people on council who understand and have worked with those who have been most affected by the housing crisis and can work collaboratively to bring innovative ideas before the city council to deal with the crisis, not people who are learning week to week about the crisis. The housing crisis will not be resolved, it will not be resolved by one means. Um, it will be resolved through a multifaceted approach. Um, I also support the Home Ownership Program Initiative, and I would like the city to continue to fund this program um, and to preserve apartment, affordable apartments in our, com in our community. Um, I also agree that we need to review inclusionary zoning um, and make sure that we work with the private sector to ensure um, that when they are built and when they are receiving funds, they are committing to affordable apartments. Thank you. Domenica Perone, your 30-second rebuttal. I would just 
agree with the added information that was provided just now, and I just want us to think about how we develop this city. We are not against development, but we want to make sure that we are developing for the people who live here. That includes accessible apartments, that includes senior housing, that includes low threshold housing, single room occupancy, first time homeowner opportunities. There is a wide range of housing needs in our city, and they are interconnected, and that is why we have a crisis on our hands. Thank you. Question four is around homelessness. We're gonna start with my day Morales. That will be followed by Morris Bergman, Johanna Hampton Dance, and Kate Toomey. You'll each get one minute, and then my day you will have a 30 second rebuttal. Question, there has been a spike in homelessness from 2022 to 2023. With a shortage of shelter beds and additional shelters facing resistance in their neighborhoods, the Standing Committee on Public Health and Human Services asked the city manager to explore possible solutions. What policies would you support to address homelessness in Worcester? My day. Thank you. Thank you for this question. Homelessness or unhoused individuals and families are not the result of laziness, unemployment, or lack of motivation. Homelessness is a result of low wages, expensive rents, and mortgages, untreated mental health issues, and domestic violence, as well as a result of strategic urban planning that addresses the needs of all the population, taking into account their income and financial instability. Homeless people are not asking for giveaways. We advocates are asking for the services that unhoused families have historically paid for and continue to pay for. Some have paid with their mental health, such as our United States veterans who experience homelessness at rates that exceed representation in the general United States population. This alone should embarrass all of us because many people who are homeless put their lives at risk to make sure we kept ours intact. Thank you. Johanna Dan, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I actually apologize. I went out of order again. Morris Bergman. Thank you. I believe the percentage of Massachusetts of homelessness is about 7%. Uh, I, I think one of the things we have to do is advocate at a state level for more state legislation that helps cities and towns like Worcester, particularly gateway cities um, like Worcester that do have a lot of uh, homeless populations. Uh, Seven percent should be a minimum that every city and town in Massachusetts should have to set aside as a percentage for the homeless populations. We cannot solve every homelessness problem from other communities. We have our hands full of the homelessness uh, challenges we have within Worcester. So I do think we need help at the state level to spread out the responsibility of the homeless situation. I do agree there's multiple factors that affect homelessness and I do support a housing first so that people that are homeless um, have an opportunity to deal with whatever issues they have by already having housing uh, as opposed to the reverse uh, of, of both of that. I do think, however, though, that at the end of the day, uh, there's a multitude of factors that have to go into trying to solve the problem. We haven't got a handle on it yet, and there's a lot more work to do. Thank you. Now, Johanna Hampton Dance. Thank you. So I have to disagree with Mr. Bergman down there on his statement of other towns are not our problem. This is a human problem when it comes to homelessness. And being on the Affordable Board of Housing Trustees here in our city that's creating housing in our city, we have seven projects completed to try to combat the homelessness problem here in our city. I would like to see more supportive housing go up throughout our city, but there's always a war about what district it's in, and it shouldn't matter. It's about people and making sure they have a place, a roof over their head and a place to sleep at night and are being taken care of in that matter. So. How I would combat that is to continue to work on the committee that I'm on to try to build more affordable housing here and reaching out to other organizations such as our clergy here in the city and talking to churches to try and create some beds because the cold is coming and they're outside. Thank you. Thank you. Kate Toomey. Thank you. Um, I uh, see this every day in my work um, with folks that have either been uh, incarcerated um, or uh, have just come out of, um, are, are dealing with other issues with addiction. Um, and the homeless situation 
has become so much worse, not just in Worcester, but all over the country. And I think the mental health, I think the um, uh, addiction issues uh, have contributed greatly to all of this. Uh, we're also seeing an increase in homelessness with our elderly uh, population. And I think that um, we really need to uh, address the emergence, uh, emergency uh, needs first, and we are coming into the winter, and we, we're really going to have to do that. We've got to have a center uh, for folks, but we also need to have more permanent housing, and we have a project of tiny homes uh, that we, we're working on, but it's been delayed, and we need to continue to do that. We need to provide rapid housing. There's no question. Thank you. My day. Thank you. Um, I support a housing first model with wraparound services. I support treating people with respect and as human beings. I don't support sabotaging and destroying what little people may have. Thank you. And with question number five on economic development, we will begin with Kate Toomey, followed by responses from Guillermo Kramer, Joe Petty, and Bill Coleman, and then a 30-second rebuttal back to Kate Toomey. So here is the question on economic development for you, Kate Toomey. Following a few high-profile economic development projects completed or underway, the city will need to prioritize new projects. Which projects or parcels have you watched most closely? What do you envision economic development to look like in the next five to ten years? Kate Toomey, one minute. Thank you very much. Um, there have been so many really great uh, 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 projects that have come up, uh, but one of the ones that I've watched the most has been um, the biotech projects and seeing how uh, it's expanding from uh, Boston, Cambridge, uh, 128 out to here. Um, I think job creation opportunities um, uh, that uh, recognize remote work aspects are probably something that we need to focus on in the future because the way people work, it's, it's changing. Uh, and I think that that's an incredible opportunity when we're looking at creating housing, do we also create work space for folks that are gonna be working remotely as well? So I think that's uh, something that we could uh, look into. Thank you. Thank you. And a response from Guillermo Kramer. Um, thanks for the topic. Um, look, when, you're, when we're looking at economic development, we're looking at the future of the city of Worcester. And I think all of us here can agree that our city has definitely improved. But who is it improving for? And I want to make sure that when we're building these new projects that are coming online, particularly the housing projects that are coming online, folks within our city feel that they actually have the opportunity to take advantage of those housing opportunities. Oftentimes, we are building these projects to bring folks into the city. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but what I'm saying is, is that there are folks that are in our city that want to move up within their housing developments. And I want to make sure that we are also catering to that as well. I think we have to remember that Worcester is actually a very young city. The average age of folks here in the city of Worcester ranges in the mid-30s. And so we have to make sure, and you wouldn't guess that. I, I see some faces, and so I, I, I know how you feel. But the reality is, is that we need to get creative with what we're doing. And creating workforce development is one of the things that I think is really important in this. Thank you. And response number two from Joe Petty. Thank you. The focus should be on momentum that we've built over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. And we have a large focus on higher education, <laughs> finance, manufacturing, both the life sciences and the biomanufacturing here in the city of Worcester. And some of the big projects I'm keeping my eye on is the St. Cobain project where uh, WBDC has taken control of that property, building pad-ready sites for businesses that come here into the city of Worcester is so important. And also the Wuxi project is uh, important for here in the city of Worcester. Uh, Biomanufacturing coming right here in the city of Worcester, their first one here in the United States will be right here in the city of Worcester. And also economic development means job focus. You know, how do you create more jobs, bring more businesses here into the city of Worcester, making sure that you have the right amenities to bring a business here in the city of Worcester, making sure the city is affordable and attractive for everybody to come in and enjoy the, everything we do here. And also part of economic development is, again, affordable housing. How do we make affordable housing for everyone here in the city of Worcester? We provide housing where people can work and live in the same city instead of commuting. Thank you. Thank you. And response number three, Bill Coleman. One minute, please. <clears throat> I don't know, I'm listening to everybody taking everything in and just thinking to myself, 
we're all talking too much. There's a lot more that needs to be done in this community. You know, we need to, the economic development issues that are coming forward in our city have to be so inclusive, you know, with regards to education, with regards to abilities, and with regards to having a place for people to live, to enjoy life, and to prosper. So my whole thing is I'm going to do some more listening. Thank you. Thank you. And back to you, Kate Toomey, with a 30-second rebuttal. Thank you very much. And part of economic development uh, includes job training. Um, and we have an incredible amount of free uh, job training that's out there. Uh, Quinn Sigamon Community College is offering a lot of new programs for folks that are coming in uh, for these new jobs. Building trades are uh, looking for uh, people, and they're making very good money. Um, and Mass Hire has um, some wonderful programs in manufacturing. And those are all the types of jobs that we're seeing uh, business coming in. Uh, so I think that's an important part of economic development. Thank you. Question six is on the subject of trash. This question will start and end with Bill Coleman, with responses from Donna Calorio, Morris Bergman, and Christian King. In the downtown, the Worcester Business Improvement District employs individuals to address litter in its catchment area. However, despite the establishment of the city manager's clean team, trash remains an issue in, the many neighbor in many of the neighborhoods. Do you feel further measures are needed? And if so, how should they be funded? Bill Coleman, one minute. I gotta tell you, from a person who has organized neighborhood cleanups in pre just about every single section of the city of Worcester, I think we need to uh, think globally and act locally. If every business, I mean, there was a time back in the 70s where every business, there would be somebody would go out with, before the business opened and swept just the trash in front of their own business. If we all did that, we all did that in front of our homes, it would make us a better city, a more attractive city. The ambassadors who go around the, uh, the uh, central part of downtown Worcester cleaning up after people. If each one of us was to pick up two pieces of, of, of trash and just put it in its proper location, I think we'd have a better city to look at, something that we can be proud of. But I continue to support the efforts of the city to keep downtown clean, open, and friendly and welcoming. Thank you. Donna Calorio, one minute. Thank you. Um, so. Trash has been an issue ever since, and recycling ever since I've been on the council. And one of the things I've looked at is that a lot of the neighborhood groups have done tremendously well in really restoring their area and helping pick up the trash. And I was part of uh, Duffy Field, Weather Elf Park, when we did a tremendous amount of cleanup in that park. And I think engaging people in the area, maybe helping or funding maybe some of these groups to provide you know, trash bags, or maybe even getting students, uh, getting them a stipend to help them with the community groups to um, pick up the trash, because I think it really helps us as a city and it helps us as a neighborhood. The other thing, too, is that um, trash, we need to kind of look at our trash bags. They're a little bit too thin and they rip all the time. And we also have to look at uh, maybe getting better recycling bins, maybe the rolling ones that we can use instead of the heavy bins that we're holding and pulling down the driveway. Thank you. Thank you. Morris Bergman, one thank, minute. Thank you for the question. I, I, there's no reason why the commercial uh, neighborhoods don't have City of Worcester uh, trash bins. Uh, they should be spread out throughout commercial neighborhoods. You see those in other cities. I've asked a question I'm sure some of my colleagues have as well. I, I don't think manpower should be an excuse for that. With respect to drop-off locations throughout the city, uh, we do have some drop-off locations for mattresses and other things, and I think we need to make that more available, more accessible. Right now it's op open for a limited amount of time. We have to make sure it's affordable. If somebody has a mattress or a TV they need to dispose of, it should be easy for them to dispose of it so we don't have to see it on the sidewalk. Lastly, let me just say something about, about parks. I do think we need more dedicated staff, particularly in the seasons that the parks are most used to keep the parks clean. If you go around the parks, there's a noticeable lack of cleanliness that shouldn't be there, particularly for those folks who need to utilize those parks in the warm, month, warm months for sports and other recreational activities. So yes, we can do better. Thank you. Christian King, one minute. There's been too much focus on the downtown. 
there's not been enough focus on the local economic hubs in our neighborhoods. We absolutely should be back to basics. Let's back, get back to the community. Let's get back to the people. Um, when it comes to further measures for trash, um, I actually filed orders after meeting with a civic group over at uh, um, Fla uh, Flag Street, uh, Burncoat, Flag Street School, Burncoat Middle, um, to actually take these trash bags, these yellow trash bags, and provide them at our local um, community service providers um, at our community uh, buildings. Um, we need to increase the hours of drop-off as well. Um, when it comes to funding, um, as chairman of municipal operations, um, I've called for audits of our overtime. I've called for audits of our, vac audits of our vacancy factor. We have to tighten up our budget, and we can get this done together um, and also civic education for the young folks. Thank you. Bill Coleman, your 30-second rebuttal. Let's keep Worcester a clean city. Thank you. <laughs> so for question seven, we change up the format a little bit. This question will be addressed to all of you, but first I uh, want to say hello to the audience. How's everybody doing out there? Are you having a lot of fun? It's a good night, isn't it? Great night for Worcester. All right, so here we go. A good question. This one's about the city manager evaluation. Listen up. This is for all of you. What measures will you use to determine whether the city manager is performing adequately, adequately and carrying out the policies and legislative priorities of the city council? Do you think the current city manager is performing effectively? Response number one for one minute is to Joe Petty. Yes, I think he's performing very effectively. I think he's a wonderful city manager. He understands the issues that the council needs to address um, here in the city to move the city forward. And as part of the evaluation process, I think the city manager meets with the city council on a regular basis. We have four categories that we evaluate him uh, um, every year, and we'll continue to do that, whether it be finances, whether it be public safety, whether it be economic development. Uh, we look at those categories. and. Uh, have a good understanding. And I did ask the city manager last year, early this year, to really look at developing some goals and strategies to present to the city council so we could send it to the Missile Operations Committee uh, to review those goals and committee and bring a back recommendation back to the city council. Thank you. Response number two, Domenica Perone, one minute. Um, I think our current city manager is performing to the best of his abilities for the way he got into the position that he's in. Personally, I think we should have had an open search because that is what we deserve in this city. I believe in democracy. I think the model of our municipal government is not exactly re reflective of that, and that is no fault of his. I think he's working really hard and trying hard, but I do think that we needed to have a search. That being said, Things that I would look for in terms of my evaluation for him, should I be on council, would be around a participatory process for the budget. Uh, I think we need to make sure that when the budget is created, which is usually done in the city manager's office with some input from departments, we need a city council that understands what that looks like and the community needs to understand what that looks like. And we need to fully fund the division of youth opportunities. Thank you. And for response number three, Johanna Hampton Dance. I agree uh, fully with what Dominica has stated. Um, in addition, I would like to say that yes, um, the way he got the seat, you know, it's kind of nepotism like, but he's in it. I respect the fact that he's in it. He did come in to clean up a mess and then try to implement his own plans, which I respect. Um, I think he has been effective, and I say that from personal experience with him. When I went to him and asked him for money for landlords to bring their buildings up to code in exchange for renting at affordable rates, guess what? A million dollars was allocated. So it was just that simple, just a simple conversation. So I think that if you are um, open for discussion and compromise and you sit down with people, you can make change effectively without even having to jump through hoops and be on a council. But I'm trying to get on it so I can make bigger change. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
And Christian King, one minute, please. You know, the prior administration um, did not have a good transition plan. Uh, this current city manager, um, as we've seen, was a lot of things that were not communicated regarding staff, regarding discipline um, of staff, regarding um, where we're moving as a city. It was simply incomplete. When we talk about asking for goals and strategies for future processes, that's the very reason to have a process. Those goals and strategies are given up front. We're not playing catch up. Um, you know, when we set uh, parameters for our city manager, it often happens during budget time, um, where we talk about individual counselors, talk about what their priorities are. And then it's up to the city manager to determine um, what the will of the council is and to move forward. And we have certain issues here with quality of life, affordability, and things of that nature. Um, those are the things that he will be evaluated on. Um, and it's an important process um, that we do. And, um, you know, again, I think he's doing the Thank best he can with what he was given. Thank you. And my day, Morales, one minute. Thank you. For me, the important thing here is how the people in this city think about the work that the city manager is doing and how it is affecting the people of this city. I realize that the process the city council currently uses is not, ad is not an adequate tool as we all saw during the last evaluation process. I look forward to working in collaboration with the city manager and council to come up with a better process for this evaluation tool and to set up measurable goals and objectives for the city manager and then hold them accountable for those and transparency. For me, effect, him effect, um, performing effectively also means meaningful diversity, equity, and inclusion work within City Hall and all the departments. Thank you. Guillermo Kramer, please, one minute. Since chairing the Human Rights Commission, I've had the opportunity to really sit with our city manager and get to know him, um, including in the, in the last several weeks just as a regular commissioner. Uh, I'm excited for the vision that he has. And the reality here is that I think that when you talk to the average resident in the city, most folks don't actually know that we have a city manager system. They don't actually understand what it's all about. And so us as counselors, we have to make sure that we are educating them that the reality is, is that our city manager needs to be held accountable to us. I think one of the things that I'd like to challenge is the fact that when, when it's time for the city manager eval process, we tend to just hear a bunch of positives and we don't push back. We don't challenge the system. And I wanna make sure that we're doing that because I'm looking forward to my relationship with the city manager, but I'm also looking forward to making sure that I'm challenging him and making sure that we are working together as a, as a team to move our city forward. Thank you. Donna Calorio, one minute. Yes, I believe um, City Manager Batista is performing effectively. Um, the evaluation is a good tool to measure the city manager's performance. We have the opportunity to list priorities and goals to have the city manager focus on throughout the year. For example, I'm chair of parking and traffic, so my focus has been on safe roads, traffic calming measures, and speed humps. These goals can be measured if we have less accidents. We also have monthly meetings with the city manager to convey our priorities, concerns, and expectations. My expectations are better roads, safety, and steady economic growth. Thank you. Thank you. And Mo Bergman, one minute. I apologize. I didn't know I was part of the original question. Could you just repeat it? Yes. What measures will you use to determine whether the city manager is performing adequately okay. and Thank carrying Thank out you. the policies and legislative po priorities of the city council? And do you think the current city manager is performing effectively? I think he's performing effectively. I think there's a learning curve in any position, although he was at City Hall 
Uh, I think he's performing effectively for the time he's been there. I do think, and this is an issue regarding the charter, I do think the once a year evaluation is problematic. I do think at that point in time in June, when we do the evaluation needs to be looked at. I understand the challenges of changing that because it's included in our charter to do it every June, but I do think one point in time, once a year, is not the best way to judge how somebody's doing. I think it should at least be done twice a year, perhaps even quarterly. I don't know if there's a way to do that beyond a, a charter change, but I do think that would be beneficial to everybody. We get more points in time to evaluate if something is going the right direction. Uh, the city manager could, could hear that from us. If something is going the wrong direction, we don't have to wait a year to get that message to him. Thank you. And one minute to Bill Coleman. I think that the um, current one-year evaluation of the city manager is inadequate. I think we need to go every two years to evaluate the city manager. That would give a real good opportunity, you know, uh, for us to evaluate long-term planning and, and beneficial aspects of uh, how our city government will move ahead for business. You know, in the auto industry, we come out with a new car every year, but years ago, we used to wait a couple of years to come out. And I think, uh, you know, changing it either through a home rule petition or whatever, at least having an open discussion on it, that we evaluate the city manager every two years would be beneficial to our community for business planning, for government planning. Thank you. And Kate Toomey, one minute, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm very proud uh, of voting uh, for Eric Batista for our city manager. Um, I believe he's doing a good job. I believe one of the most important factors um, uh, to determine the performance is our bond rating and economic health of our city. Uh, we have the ability to request reports on issues affecting our city at any time, and we hear from the community if there are issues and we adjust. Um, the International uh, City Managers Association has uh, a tool um, for evaluation of a city manager which serves two purposes, uh, to evaluate the performance of the manager and to act as a communication bridge for the manager, the mayor and the city council. It evaluates the manager on relationship with the mayor and council, relationship with employees, public relations, intergovernmental management, financial management, organizational management, and personal characteristics. Thank you, and that's it for question seven. Question eight is on the subject of the Worcester Police Department. We'll start this question and this question with Christian King with responses from Domenica Perone, Guillermo Kramer, Johanna Hampton Dance. With multiple investigations into the Worcester Police Department and the transition to a new chief of police, do you feel that there are specific policies needed to ensure accountability at the Worcester Police Department? Christian King, one minute. You know, I, I think that as we look at our law enforcement, it's important to recognize what they do well and what they don't do so well. Um, part of that is um, looking at policy. We have policy that's dated. You know, I'd like to see, um, you know, their policy as it relates to young people and how they respond to them looked at. I'd like to see um, a specialization of policing our young people. Um, we don't have that skill set anymore. The juvenile division was eliminated. Um, you know, when it comes to accountability and it comes to policing, part of that is the oversight. Part of that is trying to make sure um, that the city manager is holding folks to account. We are the city council, the city manager reports to us, and we expect that he monitors and provides the appropriate oversight um, for the Worcester Police Department. Thank you. Domenica Perone, one minute. I agree with Councillor King, and I would just add that we should have a civilian review board and that our Worcester Police Department budget is more than the HHS budget, the inspections budget, and the parks budget combined. We have an imbalanced budget in Worcester, and that shows up in many different ways in terms of how we rely on policing for a mental health crisis for a housing crisis, for youth violence even, or youth prevention. Uh, I think that we do need policing for specific violent crimes, but that is not a preventative approach. We need to have a public health lens for all of these other areas. We need social workers. We need crisis response teams that are adequately resourced, and that is what I would support. Thank you. Guillermo Kramer, one minute. 
Uh, I've served on the Human Rights Commission over the last three years, and one of the things that I'm most excited about with the commission is that we have an intimate relationship with our WPD. We have them come in on an almost quarterly basis, and we talk about the stuff that they are doing. We also make sure that we're pushing back and talking about the diversity needs that are needed on, in, our, in our WPD, talking about the stuff that they are doing out in the community. How are they connecting? We need to be very blunt and say, you know, it's, it's not great that we are under investigation. No city should be proud of that. And so I am looking forward to making sure that my relationship with the, with the interim chief and whomever will be appointed to be the, the firm chief is someone that we work together with. I've done it at the Human Rights Commission over the last couple of years, and I'm committed to working with our police department to make sure that they're centering themselves around our community. Thank you. Johanna Hampton Dance, one minute. Thank you. So this issue has been a, a topic for me since two years ago when I ran for District 2. I will always push for police reform. Just to say a few bad apples is if a few bad apples is okay doesn't sit well with me. And when I say reform, I'm talking about not just how they police, because yes, it starts internally. How their department is built and how it operates from the inside out reflects on the city and how they treat people in the city and how they police our streets. They are supposed to serve and protect. And that needs to be done by a proper vetting system not just because you want to be, uh, become a police officer, you're able to become a police officer, mental health screenings for those officers, making sure that they're stable enough to police our streets is what matters. Thank you. Christian King, your 30 second rebuttal. You know, it's clear that oversight of law enforcement here in the city of Worcester has fallen short in terms of the legislative branch, and that's us, the city council. We have a public safety committee that's required to do oversight hearings as it relates to all of the concerns that were mentioned in the question. And that simply has not occurred. Um, and I look forward to, um, as the next term begins, to making sure um, that we have that sort of oversight. I'm proud to have led on body cameras. Um, I'm proud to have led on social workers co-responding with police officers. Um, if we want to engender the trust of the community, we have to make sure that that transparency and oversight is there. Thank you. Question nine, WRTA. Johanna Hampton Dance will start us. Then we will have for the first response, my day Morales. Second response, Donna Calorio. Third response, Joe Petty. And then we will have the rebuttal with Johanna. So the question. The Worcester Regional Transit Authority has suspended the collection of fares through June of 2024. Do you support the permanent extension of fare-free service on the WRTA? How can the city support the WRTA in order to improve service and ridership? Johanna Hampton Dance. Thank you. So yes, I do support um, the buses remaining fare-free. I think that um, the city should get together with the state delegation and really continue to have those conversations to push for more funding and look for uh, creative ways to keep generating money so that they stay fare free. I also think that um, hiring more bus drivers so that we can expand on routes throughout our city and frequency. Um, I, I hate to talk personal, but I met a blind woman who relies on our bus system and she lived way far away from a bus stop, but that's her use. And we have to keep those type of people in mind when we're talking about these issues such as transportation and mobility and making sure that they're able to get from point A to point B. <laughs> um, just to wrap up my thought, yes, we need more money for our buses. We need to keep them fare free. We need to have accessibility across the board for every side of the city in every aspect. Thank you. Thank you. My day, Morales, one thank, minute. Thank you. Um, yes, I do support continuing the zero fare. The cost of charging someone to pay a fee f for riding the bus is greater than allowing the zero fares process to continue. Thank you. 75% of funding comes from the state. Um, if you can increase ridership, then that increases the federal state funds received by the WRTA. 
if we have people riding the bus to go to school, to go to work, and to go out and spend money in our city, this also helps our environment by reducing the tailpipe emissions. So it's a win-win. This is a public service that needs to be protected and expanded. Low income and marginalized employed folks benefit from this work. Thank you. Thank you. Donna Gloria, one minute. Worcester will be staying fair free until June 2024. If we're going to stay fair free, it's all about paying for the operating expenses on either the state or the federal level. Homeowners should not be financially burdened with this. The bus routes need to be expanded at some point with a more consistent schedule. I hear constantly about buses not showing up when scheduled and times not met, leaving residents stranded or being late to appointments. We have a lot of work to do with our public transportation system to achieve a robust, on-time, dependable public transportation system. Thank you. Thank you. Joe Petty, one minute. Yes, I, I support the continued fare free. Uh, my vision for the expansion of public transportation is an expansion of the WRTA. Um, and street revitalization and maintenance, which ties into the city's mobility plan, if you already look at that, the action plan that the city's creating now. And my intention is focused on the city's basic needs. You know, fare free also boosts the workforce. It allows people to uh, get or take access and also overcome barriers of going to work. That's important. It allows the elderly to go to the doctor visits, allow the people to go out and buy their groceries and come home. So I think a good part of the population needs this, and we'll continue this. And we should invest in fare free into the bus system at a greater level than what it is now. And the budgets are all about priorities, and this is a priority that I think makes a difference here in the city of Worcester. We can evaluate this at the end of the year, um, which we did in the past year, evaluate each year, and also partner with our state delegation, our federal delegation, on how to fund transportation on a tire basis, not just buses, trains, et cetera, uh, to make sure that people have fair access to transportation here in the city. Thank you. Johanna, rebuttal, 30 seconds. I don't think I have a rebuttal. I mean, what it comes down to me, uh, for, for me, is keeping them fare free by any means necessary. Um, we're trying to get to net zero emissions here in the city. We're trying to be a, a walkable city. And I think um, having the public transit available and even expanding the time frame that we run, um, because if you go to other major cities, you go to Boston, you're catching a bus until midnight. So things like that. Let's be innovative. Let's be creative. Let's think outside the box. Thank you. Question 10, tax rate, and this is for Joe Petty, followed by Kate Toomey, Dominica, Mo Bergman, and a rebuttal from Joe Petty. So it's a long one. Due to Worcester's dual tax rates for residents, for residential and commercial or industrial property tax, the setting of a new tax rate each year turns into a battle between business owners and homeowners. Businesses have said that the higher commercial rate is a disincentive to economic development in Worcester, while residents say that taxes are already too high and do not believe a single tax rate would broaden the tax base enough to lower their rates. How, do you, how would you approach the tax rate decision? One minute, Joe Petty. The question was a one minute, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, this has been, I wish in 1984, we'd never had the split tax rate. I think it was the biggest mistake that the, uh, that the council made at that time. I understand the reasons they did it, probably the same reasons why we have the issue of housing here in the city of Worcester so expensive. But the uh, way I approach it, I look at the numbers every, every year and see what's fair for the business community and for the residential. Uh, I don't go in with the frame of mind that I'm going to vote the highest um, residential tax rate or the lowest business tax rate or the opposite. I just try to do what's fair. And I think that one time we, we, we would never get to a single tax rate, but it was important that we were pushing that way because job creation and businesses is what drives the city of Worcester, small business, large business, and we need those jobs. When people, uh, we have a lot of amenities that people want to come here to the city of Worcester. We have a good education workforce here, but we also have people who cannot come to the city of Worcester because they can go to a surrounding town and open up their business for a lot cheaper than what we can do here in the city of Worcester. 
Thank you. And one minute response from Kate Toomey, please. Thank you very much. Um, as, as I usually do, I not, only, I, I not only look at the report, but also other sources of information, the current state of the economy, property values, other cities, towns, um, rates, and more. And I think um, a single tax rate is not possible to do currently, as the mayor said, but we do need to start to close the gap if we can. And I'm very concerned about it because right now our commercial properties are, um, have a lot of empty space. And if those lose value, uh, the homeowner is going to end up paying more anyway. So if we can find ways to bring more business in, it broadens the tax base and reduces uh, the burden on, uh, on uh, everyone uh, by having more entities of uh, business here in our city. Thank you. Thank you. And a one minute response from Domenica Perone, please. I would agree that I am, a, again, I'm a data-driven person, so I would never support increasing the homeowner tax rate because, again, I have a public health lens and we are in a housing crisis. That being said, when I did look at the business tax rate, it is an outlier. It is pretty high compared to all of our surrounding towns, and it's one of the highest in the state. And so I do support a plan where we have to look at how we can incrementally start moving toward that single tax rate. That being said, I think that we need to look at different small business owners, BIPOC-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, the same TIFs and tax breaks that we can give to larger developers I want to see those same breaks going to different small businesses. And so I would support doing research into a plan that can look at businesses differently because we do know that they are so diverse in the city. Thank you. And one minute to Mo Bergman, please. Thank you. I'd look at ways to try to take pressure off the commercial tax rate, but I wouldn't do it at the expense of the residential uh, taxpayers. Uh, with, on the commercial side, um, there are opportunities with TIFs and opportunities to pass on increased taxes to the end product of whatever the commercial, prop, commercial business owner is making. Those aren't ideal, ideal uh, scenarios, but the residential taxpayer has really only two options. If it's a, a rentable property, they're going to pass those uh, increase in residential taxes on to their tenants, and we've all talked about the difficult time people have in paying uh, rent these days, so I wouldn't want to see that happen. We are leaving a lot of money on the table to the 30% plus of nonprofits who don't pay their taxes, and I know that's more of a state and federal issue, but we shouldn't ignore that. And lastly, we've seen a history of tax liens for small amounts of money and people losing their houses because of that. That only stresses the importance of not raising residential property tax. Thank you. And a 30-second rebuttal from Joe Petty, please. It's clear that the, the homeowners and the businesses are paying, high, paying taxes, a high amount of taxes here in the city of Worcester. But as that business base shrinks, and you can see it now, even though we vote, the council has voted the world's residential where it can over the last few years or close to it, their base is going to get bigger of the, uh, of the revenue needed to support the city of Worcester. So that's my biggest fear. So we need incentives for the business community uh, that will bring down their tax base, tax rate here in the city of Worcester, so they can hire people, create jobs, and stay here in the city of Worcester and invest here in the city of Worcester. Thank you. And that's it for question 10. Question 11 is on the subject of a mobility action plan. This question will start and finish with Morris Bergman with responses from Bill Coleman, Maide Morales, and Guillermo Kramer. The city is engaging in a mobility action plan managed by the new Department of Transportation and Mobility with a draft plan estimated for public release in winter 2024. What would you like to see addressed in the mobility action plan? What about the prioritization plan for the complete streets program? Morris Bergman, one minute. I, su I support the complete street program. I do think there is an opportunity that we're missing out on synchronized lighting for our traffic patterns. I've mentioned this before, and I think it's worth mentioning again. We have increased com construction work happening throughout the city. We have increased development happening throughout the city. We have a much larger number of people living here, and invariably that means many more cars than we've had before. We've had a lot of traffic issues, and that affects quality of life in so many levels. I think we need to look at what's done in a lot, large major cities, which is a 
pilot program and synchronizing lights in different parts of the city where it makes sense to do so. I'd like to see that included in the, mo in the mobility plan uh, as well. I do support complete streets. I do think that the office is something I supported, and I do think there's opportunities in that office to improve things. I will say there are a certain number of streets in every, city of the, every section of the city of Worcester that don't line up well. They're dangerous locations. Cambridge and Southbridge Street, Mill Street, and uh, Chandler Street. We need to look at those, the highest risk of accidents, and try to address those as well. Thank you. Bill Coleman, one minute. I support a mobility plan that is um, one that reflects requirements from the federal government. You know, uh, before we used to have a, um, a director of uh, our streets, and he would make sure that everything that we did in Worcester, you know, all the money that came in, came in through the federal government lens. We've had people die on our streets in Worcester. You know, I think of Lincoln Street. Every time I look in a newspaper, somebody's getting hit on Lincoln Street. So I do support a comprehensive mobility plan that addresses uh, able and disabled people in this community, but makes it a safe city to live and to walk around and to travel on. Thank you. My Day Morales, one minute. Thank you. Um, yes, I also support a uh, Worcester Mobility Action Plan that is well thought out and includes um, not all of the people that live in this city. Um, as I have been out canvassing and walking the streets uh, and the sidewalks, um, there's a lot of areas that are not comparable for a lot of folks to be able to walk around it safely. Um, I and I would support ensuring the safety in our streets also, f um, like some of the folks have said before, around Mill Street and Lincoln Street, Belmont Street, those are areas that are concerning where, you know, multiple folks have gotten hurt in those spaces. So, thank you. Thank you. Guillermo Kramer, one minute. So the mobility plan came from Now Next, you know, that there was a transition from the Now Next program, and I was... I was able to serve as a consultant in the early phases of the mobility plan. Um, you know, one of the things that excites me is the fact that we start, we need to start looking at our city uh, towards the future. And uh, while I'm not here to say it's time to get rid of cars, so that's not what's happening, we need to embrace the fact that we have to start building neighborhoods that are transit centric. We need to make sure that we are catering to the needs for folks that are walking, the needs for folks that are rolling from one place to another, and the needs to ensure that we have bike lanes that are appropriate, but also we have a fare free system that is strong, and that is actually moving our city forward, literally. And so we have to make sure that we're thinking about this in the sense of folks that are using it to go to work, folks that are using it to go to the grocery store, and also folks that are using it for leisure, because right now, we're not doing that. Thank you. Morris Bergman, your 30-second rebuttal. Uh, again, I, I support the mobility plan. I, I think there are certain aspects of it that could be uh, improved upon. I think looking at those dangerous intersections that I've discussed and others as well is one of those plans that need to, one of those issues that needs to be focused upon. And I also think that synchronized lights, as I said before, is something missing um, from the plan uh, addressing, but I do think in general it's a good plan, needs to move forward and we can do better with our um, mobility in the city and I'm looking forward to seeing the final product. Thank you. Question 12, refugees. We will start with Guillermo Kramer with one minute and we'll follow by with a response from Christian King, then Kate Toomey, then Donna Calorio. Question. Refugees. The city has formed a new arrival task force to help address the immediate and long-term solution for the recent influx of <laughs> refugees. Do you think the city is appropriately responding to the needs of this population? Guillermo. I think one of the things that we need to be honest about is the topic of an influx usually is a negative connotation. And I want to make sure that we're steering clear from that. The reality is, is that when folks come into the city of Worcester, it is part of an investment to our city, and that's how we have to see it. As a city, we need to commit ourselves to ensuring that the residents and the folks that do come into our city are welcomed, but are also have the resources to develop themselves and ensure that they are appropriately acclimating to our, to our society here in Worcester. 
I think Worcester's richness comes from diversity, and the reality is, is that being here as a Latino, I was an immigrant. My, par my, my parents were immigrants, and so ultimately, we embrace that here in Worcester. And so I don't see it as an influx because of the negative connotation, but rather an invitation for the folks that are coming into our city. And so I hope that we as a city take that and invest in those folks that are going to be living here. Thank you. Christian King, you have one minute. Thank you. The, um, certainly the task force is part of this process and part of the solution. Um, really kind of the public-private intersection is necessary um, in order to try to figure out how to wrap around these families um, and these individuals that are here. Um, I want to just also share that, you know, I personally am a first generation American. My parents came from the island of Bermuda. Um, they were undocumented for a period of time. Also, my father in law, my wife's dad, is a political refugee who, sought, who gained asylum here from, um, from Laos. And, you know, this is the American way. We help others. It's what this city is all about. We accept and we help, but we can't do it alone. We, it requires our federal and our state legislators to provide us funding. It's a strain on our housing, it's a strain on health, um, hospitals, and it's a strain on our schools. But we can do this and we can do it together. Thank you. Kate Toomey. Thank you. Um, since there was no notice and no funding, I think that the city is doing what we can. I know the manager is working with the nonprofits and businesses, uh, working with the Welcome Center to assist in identifying people's needs and then triage them to appropriate agencies. And there were several local nonprofits that did that this past week. On October 5th, the governor, um, the Senate president, and House speaker met on Zoom with the Washington delegation to request $250 million for support from the federal government in a supplemental budget which that may not even be enough. Uh, but along with stable permanent housing, uh, we need to address the issue of emergency and temporary housing. As I said before, we're waiting for the Tiny Homes Project to come on board, but we need this rapid housing now. Um, Homeland Security also needs to fast track the work authorization process for work visas so these individuals can support themselves and their families. In the meantime, I hope that the folks will be able to get work, will be given basic knowledge acquisition and training for the potential jobs that they'll get. Thank you. Donna, Gloria, one minute. The influx of refugees is a national problem. Currently, the population of refugees are quickly exceeding state and federal capacity. We must engage our federal and state partners to the proper status to become a vibrant, engaged member of our diverse Worcester community. Putting refugees in hotels is not the long-term solution. Our hotels are full and we need a permanent solution. Thank you. Thank you. Guillermo, you have 30 seconds for a rebuttal. So I think my big thing here is that we don't look at this as a negative thing. I think we have to look at it as a positive thing and we have to own it. Ultimately, I'm really excited that our community partners have stepped up. We need to make sure that we're providing them the resources they need to continue the great services that they're offering. It has been mentioned that state and federal level needs to step in, but the reality is, is that our mayor needs to make sure that they have a strong relationship with the state and federal delegation. I don't think that's what's happening right now. I think we need a stronger relationship with our governor, and we need to make sure that we're honing in on that to, so that it benefits our city and benefits any problems that we may have. Thank you. Question 13 is our last question of the evening, and this question will then be followed by closing statements. Question 13 is on the subject of differentiation, and each of the 10 candidates will have one minute to respond. What differentiates you from your fellow candidates? What is your top priority for the city of Worcester? We'll start with Kate Toomey, one minute. Okay, um, the top priority for me uh, is that uh, we're moving forward with recruiting new and diverse classes for police and fire as the numbers of employees are very low. As a matter of fact, uh, we have the potential to lose anywhere between 50 to 100 police officers through attrition retirement uh, over the next two years. And I think it's really important that for public safety, for all citizens in Worcester, that we work very hard to make sure that we're recruiting uh, a diverse workforce uh, and folks that, uh, that will be able to uh, provide um, safety for our citizens. Um, and I think that uh, that's an important aspect because public safety uh, will, will uh, help all of our, our folks. Um, we need, 
actually to include, as other people have said, social workers as part of that. Um, and I think that's a, a priority. Thank you. Thank you. Morris Bergman, one minute. One minute. I think it doesn't make me any better or any worse than anyone else, but I think it, what separates me from, from a lot of my colleagues is that I'm very open about telling people what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. And I think all the, often, too, too often in politics, people answer a question pandering to who's asking the question. Uh, I certainly don't do that. My top priority is home ownership opportunities. As I started out my opening statement, uh, two-thirds of the people in Worcester do not own their own homes. Oftentimes when you own your own home, your rent is... Um, Less, you know, rent is going to be more than your mortgage, so there are opportunities when you, with home ownership. It also creates generational wealth. Without ownership, you don't have that wealth. Let's face it, nobody ever got rich renting. And we're trying to help people in Worcester get ahead. We need more people to own their own homes. We need to give them the opportunity to do that. I'm proud of the fact that I helped convince the city manager to add an additional million dollars for first-time home ownership opportunities. I think that's a route we need to take, and we need to continue to take that route to give people that opportunity to create wealth. Thank you. Joseph Petty, one minute. I think my uh, experience and my understanding of how the city is, is doing, I think I look at it as a... Uh, a city that's on the move, that's going in the right direction, and uh, have that experience to bring people together and make sure we can move the city forward. My top priority, which we've already talked about, would be, again, affordable housing here in the city of Worcester. I think that's the number one priority moving forward, uh, along with other initiatives, whether it be mental health or building schools or uh, looking at uh, other issues that really bring the city forward. But this is the same thing, affordable housing. Of all the different programs we have, the Housing Trust Fund, the Community Preservation Act, these are initiatives that need to be expanded upon so that there is a naturally occurring affordable housing. With every initiative that's created, I want to aim forward to make an advance sustainable so the generational wealth can be built by the homeowners while folks are not dissuaded from staying in the city because of the cost of housing. I'd like to expand what I've done and promote this goal. And uh, incentivize multifamily homeowners to look at the incentives here in the city of Worcester. Make sure people are understanding what the, all the incentives are. And next week, we're going to bring all the housing initiatives in the city into the city council for a discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Guillermo Kramer, one minute. I think one of the things that separates me from, from those of us that are up here is that I, I lead by lived experiences. It's something that I did when I co-founded the organization down in D.C., and it's something that I continue to do here. The reality is, is that the lived experiences that I have and that many of us have, they're truly not unique, but they're still unique at the decision-making table. When I talk about the stuff that I have experienced growing up, I resonate with some folks who truly believe that their experience was unique. But the reality is, is that there's a lot of struggle that's happening in the city. And there are a lot of folks that truly need us to step up and to have these uncomfortable conversations so that we can actually achieve something. My hope is that we are really moving towards embracing lived experience as a main catalyst to moving our city forward. And so I'm excited to see what this new adventure will bring and what the next two years will bring as well. Thank you. Donna Calorio, one minute. Thank you. I think what separates me is my, my unique background. I'm a businesswoman. I've taught at the community school, Queen Sigmund Community College for 30 plus years. I've been a psychotherapist, I've been a coach. There's a lot of things that I've done and all that together makes a unique package that I call Donna Clorio. <laughs> um, but my, um, my priorities are public safety, economic growth, and constituent service. And I lead all that with a lens of common sense. Thank you. Thank you. Christian King, one minute. Thank you again, I'm a, I'm a girl dad of three. Um, I'm a social worker for almost 30 years here in the city. My priorities are related to the quality of life that we need to have. We all agree about concerns regarding public safety, mental health, and housing. The devil's always in the details. How do you get there? I think we need to get there by relying on evidence-based research um, to move this city forward. I think my leadership is one of intentionality, the ability to work through tough votes to get things done. And it's evidenced by being able to secure, secure millions of dollars for a mental health co-response with Worcester Police and a mental health response um, by hiring additional social workers in health and human services um, to deal with our unsheltered. And I think we have to continue to be in intentional 
about making sure that we're not subsidizing um, corporations and businesses by increasing taxes on the back of the homeowner, the residents, the people on fixed incomes, our young people. That's not the way to go. Thank you. My day Morales, one minute. Thank you. Um, I think what differentiates me from <clears throat> other folks that are here at this table is that I have been working in the front lines for a really long time. I have been sitting down across the table with folks who are coming in in need of food, in need of diapers, um, um, and it's sleeping in their cars, right? And so we, I have been working with the community, with the people who are most affected by these policies and decisions that are made at this table, but yet they're not being counted. And so I bring that voice to the table. Um, and so I think that's what makes me special amongst this group. Um, I, my top priority, of course, is around affordable housing and um, making sure that um, those that live in Worcester can continue to live in Worcester because Worcester is a beautiful city. Thank you. Thank you. Domenica Perone, one minute. Thank you. I think what separates me from the folks at this table is a combination between my lived and professional experiences. As I mentioned earlier, I absolutely lead with my values, my identity, and my equity lens. I am a Latina, I'm a renter, I'm 31 years old, I was not born in Worcester, I moved to Worcester seven years ago, I came here for Clark University, and I stayed because I love this city. I work with community on the ground, and if I have the proximity to power and privilege because of how I advocate, I'm absolutely gonna take advantage of that while I can, while I'm here. I am a reflection of a wave that is going on in Worcester right now, and I am here to fight for those changes so that we can have a city that is happy, healthy, and safe for our future generations, so that I can own a home and have a family here and be a part of the city that I am so proud of. Um, I think the issue that's most important to me with five seconds, early education and care. I'm sad we didn't get to talk about it tonight, but I did hear our city manager commit to a plan tonight previous to this at the Senior Center for Together for Kids Coalition. Thank you. Bill Coleman, one minute. My passion. I mean, everybody here has great ideas. I've listened, I've absorbed, and I sit back and I think the first time I ran for office in the city of Worcester was in 1979. And if I was to ask how many people can raise their hand who were old enough to vote back then, this place would be emptied out almost. But since 1979, and having worked in Washington in 1976 for a United States Senator at Brook, first African American elected by popular vote, you know, taking all that and being determined and having the passion and serving the people of Worcester as a community advocate, I'm ever more determined and I can't wait for the opportunity to show the folks in this community what I'm willing to do for them. Thank you. Thank you. And to end question 13, Johanna Hampton Dance, one minute. Second time I've been last this week. <laughs> what sets me apart? Everybody said everything that I would say, but I would say my lived experiences are what sets me apart um, from the bunch up here. I know what it is to stand in a food pantry line. I know what it is to get fuel assistance. I know what it is to have Section 8. I know what it is to live in the projects. That was my life. But I also know the other side of that coin. I know what it is to be a homeowner. <laughs> I know what it is to be a small business owner. And so I like to be able to relate to everyone on every level because I've been on every level. I know what it is to be homeless too. So there's a lot of layers to me. And I think that utilizing those life experiences and a job for council, I'll be able to put everyone's best interests at the forefront. And my goal is to bring balance to the city council. My goal is to keep our residents here while moving our city forward. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now end the evening with one minute closing statements from each candidate. Guillermo Kramer, one minute. 
When I had to convince my now husband to move back to Worcester here with me because we met in D.C., I knew it was going to be easy because he's an immigrant from Africa. And I knew that there was plenty that this city had to offer. There was so much richness and diversity here. And I was excited to show him this city. And he's embraced it. And immigrants that come to our city really love it here as well. I'm running for mayor and city council at large because it's time to start something new. It's time to bring in new leadership. And it's time to ensure that we are committed to the next chapter of our city. We have to make sure that we're focusing on our neighborhoods. We have to focus on what our residents need and really empower our city to be the regional leader that I know that we are. I'm looking forward to November 7th and I'm hoping that to earn at least two of your votes. And so I hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thank you. Joseph Petty, one minute. Thank you, I just, <clears throat> just wanna thank everybody for asking the questions I, I, and all the sponsors and the Research Bureau for making this happen today. I wanna thank my fellow colleagues up here on the panel here today doing a good job. And uh, I'm gonna run on, one of the things I'm proud of about being the mayor of the city of Worcester is I really promoted the idea, especially in the previous presidential um, president, of being a welcoming city for everybody here in the city of Worcester. I think that's leadership, and that's why Worcester is so successful. But uh, again, I'm gonna end this by saying, look, I'm gonna go back to the basics here in the city of Worcester. I'm gonna focus on clean streets, public safety, affordable housing, the environment, and also job creation. But also I'm gonna focus on making sure Brunkle High School gets built, East Miller gets revitalized and remodeled, and also economic development jobs. Economic development is so important that we keep this momentum that we have and to keep it going here in the city of Worcester. So in my closing seconds, I'll just ask for your vote for city council and for mayor on November 7th, and please come out to vote, prove them all wrong. We're gonna do well for 20% this year. Thank you. Thank you. Domenica Perone, one minute. Thank you all for having me here tonight. I would just say that this campaign is not about me. I am very lucky to have an incredible campaign team. We've knocked over 5,000 doors. I've been able to secure over 14 endorsements. We've raised over $30,000 from small donors. That is a grassroots campaign, and that is what this campaign is about. And so I look at Worcester and individuals holistically because of the lens and background that I have, and that is what I will promise to bring to the table. I work really hard. I hope everyone can see that through the work that I've put out into the city in various avenues and through this campaign. And for those reasons, I ask for your vote on November 7th. Lucky number six. <laughs> Thank you. Morris Bergman, one minute. Well, thank everybody for participating and those attending. A comment was made in the beginning that the backgrounds are changing in the city of Worcester. That's true, but the values aren't. People still want a piece of the American dream. As I said earlier, I say what people need to hear, not what, they, uh, what I think they want to hear. One of the things they need to hear is home ownership. It's an important asset to have. It creates generational wealth. Most of the people here will tell you um, that that's not true, um, that there are other opportunities or other ways to be uh, successful. That's not true. Uh, home ownership, if, unless you want to rent, is one of the greatest ways to create generational wealth. I also have the temperate maturity and respect to be a good colleague. You'll never hear anybody on the council say otherwise. You'll never see anything in my social media that says otherwise. I make decisions based on facts, not on emotion. I'm a sincere person, and I use common sense. There was a vote taken earlier on the city council to ban gas stations, and uh, the preference would ban new gas stations. Uh, the preference would be to go to electric cars. Only 4% of the population uses electric cars. I thought that was a bad vote. I'm proud of, of voting against that, and that's not the common sense people in the city of Worcester uh, want. They don't want people to say, do as I say, not as I do. Thank you. Kate Toomey, one minute. Thank you. I'm a wife, mother to three public school graduates and grandmother to two. I'm running for re-election to the Worcester City Council because I'm committed to the work I have been part of to make positive change in Worcester. I bring a depth and breadth of experience to the City Council that many do not have. As an educator, involved in the senior care field, addiction treatment field, and now in re-entry for the Sheriff's Office. I've also had a small business. My work in the community uh, includes being a founding member of the Worcester Working Coalition for Latino Youth, president of Park Spirit and SOFA Save Our Fine Arts and other organizations. I've helped raise tens of thousands of dollars for parks, youth sports, arts, and robotics programs. We all want the same things. Safe communities, clean streets, good schools, great jobs. 
I'll continue to work hard for you to make sure that your city is safe for everyone. I will continue to work to bring new business and more housing and jobs to Worcester. Please consider giving me one of your votes for City Council at large. I'm number three on the ballot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Christian King, one minute. City of Worcester is changing. Representation is changing. As a city council for eight years, I'm experienced and I'm part of that change. Um, on the city council, I've led the fight for safe schools, equipping educators with necessary resources, successfully bringing back middle school sports. I continue to fight against increasing residential property taxes and have advocated for transparency and accountable government, especially, again, when it comes to our tax earning dollars. Our, sim our current style of leadership is failing. Our housing prices are skyrocketing. Um, crime and mental health are problematic challenges. Um, I'm happy to say that I'm known to deliver. I've, I've delivered on expanding municipal and constituent services. I've delivered on making sure that we transition quickly from assistant city manager to a acting city manager. And once this manager came in as chair of municipal operations, working closely, I've also filed orders to establish the first black and LGBTQ plus commission. I will continue to deliver for the people of Worcester. Thank you. My day, Morales, one minute. Thank you. I'm a person that's always focusing on the big picture, and that's what I want to do. I want to focus on the big picture for our city. How do we get more people engaged? How do we, how to be a better leader, not only in our community, but also on the council? People who have worked with me can attest to that. We, as a city, need to help people in their path forward. Life is really hard right now. And I want to help move us forward, not backwards. If you agree and want to help me move our city forward, I humbly ask for one of your six votes on November 7th for my De Morales for City Council at Large for the City of Worcester. Number two on the ballot. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Donna Calorio, one minute. Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. As a four-year city councilor, we have moved our city forward. We, with new housing, improved streets, and economic growth. As a lifelong resident in Worcester, I love the city. My name is Donna Calorio, and I humbly ask for your vote on November 7th. Thank you. Thank you. Johanna Hampton Dance, one minute. My name is Johanna Hampton Dance. I'm a mom. I am a resident here in Worcester. I'm a small business owner, a homeowner, an activist, and ready to fight for everybody in this city. <laughs> I am unafraid. I will speak up. I will step up. I'm not a woman of many words, but I am a woman of big actions. So I humbly ask you to vote on November 7th, and guess what? I'm number seven on it. <laughs> Thank you. Seven on seven, baby. <laughs> And last but not least, Bill Coleman, one minute. I believe the United States of America is the greatest country in the world. Opportunity for any person's dream is only limited to the self-imposed borders of one's imagination. I consider myself a patriotic, loyal American willing to give my energies for life for the principles which keep this country and its citizens free. I ask for your vote on November 7th to be an at-large member of the Worcester City Council and your consideration to be the next mayor of the city of Worcester. So as we conclude, thank you for coming here tonight and just keep in mind, vote Bill Coleman. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all the candidates for all of your responses this evening.